Why hello? Um, you know, um, a trauma from my childhood um, keeps coming up for me lately. Every few years, it just comes back to me. And it's a, you know, it's a trauma from my childhood, but what you don't realize or what I didn't, I didn't think of it as a trauma when I was a kid because it just happened and then it was over and I just didn't, I didn't think about it again for like, for years, for like 20 years. Just, you know, just like I always say, it was like there's, there was no music telling me this was a traumatic moment. It wasn't like in slow motion. It was just like this moment and then the next moment and then the next moment. But I haven't, uh, you know, I, I was like, God, I, I need to talk to my therapist about this, but I haven't been to therapy since June because my therapist who has changed my life and my world and my point of view and my perspective in such positive, amazing ways, um, it turns out it was a, it was a COVID denier. When I saw, when I like I had a session with him in June, I just was like, I don't know. I just feel like I can't talk to him. I, I don't know. So I, I feel kind of therapist-less right now. Uh, so I just figured I'd talk about it here because, you know, I don't know. Mr. Rogers says if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And I figure y'all could call in with your um, insights and shit and get a little therapy here. <laughs> so this is the story. Okay. Uh, you know, listen, I was 13. I went to visit my sister Laura at Berkeley, uh, in Berkeley, California. I, um, she was at summer school at UC Berkeley. And I was 13, I was, I was teeny, teeny, tiny for my age when I was 13. You know, I was like one of those, like real weird little kids. And I had never flown by myself before. And, uh, you know, normally I'd be extra scared um, because I was a, a bedwetter. But, you know, I slept every night in bed with my sister, Laura, and uh, so I wasn't scared because, you know, she has to love me. <laughs> so it was really fun. It was a really fun trip. I got to be really independent. I fell in love with Berkeley um, and, and I fell in love with being on my own, you know, because my Laura had classes all day. But I kept myself busy. I found out I found out, like pickup soccer games and I. You know, you know, I went to Blondie's Pizza. They have like slices this big. And uh, if you're listening at home, I uh, just made a really big shape with my arm. <laughs> but yeah, I spent most of my time with this guy named Les, Leslie, Les, um, who lived in the dorm room next to my sister. Yeah, his name was Les. He did not seem to have any classes to go to. And he liked hanging out with teeny tiny me. Yeah, that's all I remember about him. His name was Les. He had like uh, shaggy blonde hair. And he liked hanging out with me and I would hang out with him in his room. And one day I went to his room to hang out and he was different, different energy. And I, you know, I didn't know about drugs. I, looking back, he was on drugs. You know, not weed, but like a, a drug drug, you know? I don't know, a speedy drug or a... Maybe it was a hallucinogen. Maybe it was cokey, methy. I don't know. But um, I just felt like, oh, he's different, you know? But I didn't think much of it. I just... You know, you just think as a kid, uh, I must be imagining this. Okay, sorry. Enough trauma foreplay. <laughs> this is what happened. He came over and he picked me up. He lifted me up against my will and he held me out an 18 story window from my ankles. And you know that feeling, the moment right before you're murdered? I do, I actually do because uh, I knew I was gonna die. But I didn't, he pulled me back in as quickly as I was dangling out a high rise window. I was uh, safe on the floor of his dorm room. And he acted like nothing had happened. 
and he was a grown up, so I assumed nothing happened. The only evidence was the rawness of my throat from screaming and my heart pounding just so hard. But in the following minutes, it, it, um, it, my heartbeat slowed. And before I knew it, it was truly like nothing happened. It never even occurred to me to tell my parents or anyone. And it's just so interesting because every few years, when it comes up for me, I desperately try to find this guy, but I, I don't have a last name. Laura doesn't remember his last name. She remembers only what I remember. His name is Les, or Leslie, Les for short. He was blonde, and he was at UC Berkeley Summer School in the summer of 1984. Those search words do not yield fruitful results. But why am I even looking for him? I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know what that impulse is. What am I looking for? I don't know. I don't feel rage towards him. I actually don't at all. But I think it was just that he was the only other person there. You know? So I have a this connection to him, this intimacy, this connection. He's a part of me. Also, by the way, he also gave me porn. Um, yeah, he gave a, a tiny 13-year-old girl porn. But I don't think that affected me in any way. Wink, wink. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this guy, um, I don't feel anger towards him. I, this poor guy was so fucked up. And I know he didn't do this consciously, but it's a cycle of abuse, I guess. So, you know, he needed to fuck me up. So he wasn't alone in it, maybe. You know, it's like, but like the bond I feel with him, <laughs> is that the right word? I don't know. You know, I mean, is it like, like when, a, you know, a, a, a young adult, you know, young kid kills somebody and they go to jail and they end up becoming very close with the family of the person they killed because as crazy it is, as it is, they've got a bond. They, they have this experience no one else can understand together. And it's probably healing, I guess. I think, yeah, definitely, I would think. I guess my fear in finding less, which I won't, I'm sure, <laughs> is that um, he would have no recollection of it. And you know what that made me think of? Oh, the digressions we have here. Um, is the Kavanaugh hearings. Because this woman was held down, was pinned down against her will by Brett Kavanaugh. And she remembers it, and he doesn't. Of course he doesn't. For a bully, that's just another Saturday night. But I fucking promise you, because I know firsthand that you do not forget being held down against your will. That you remember. I know why even. It's because adrenaline pumps through your body and that makes you remember stuff. It's why you remember, uh, you know, where you were at uh, for 9-11 or when JFK died, which was before I was born. But you know what I'm talking about. Those are always the, always the examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do not forget being held down against your will. You can try, but no, you will never forget it. So I can imagine asking Les, and I could be like, do you remember holding a little girl by her ankles? And very, very likely he won't. What's my point? This is a very humorless rant. But I feel it still had moxie. Oh yeah, so do, uh, what do you guys think? Do any of you, uh, there's, what are the chances someone out there is like, I know this less. I know who you're talking about. He's doing well, he's married, he has a family. Uh, I don't know. I'd be curious. Maybe you can give me a helpful uh, perspective on this. I'm fine, by the way, I'm great. But I'd love um, insight, I guess. 
Here's some ads. Magic spoon, baby, yum. We are all trying to eat better, but a healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic spoon has the amazing flavors you love without all the bad stuff. This cereal is seriously impressive. It has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, and it contains only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, it's gluten-free, it's grain-free, it's soy-free, it's low-carb, and it is GMO-free. I used to love sugar cereals. I grew up and realized it was not good for me, and I stopped until I discovered Magic Spoon, and oh my God, it's like sugar cereals that are good for you. Boom. Magic Spoon has released a super delicious new flavor, birthday cake. What? Birthday Cake Magic Spoon will be available in a special five pack for a limited time only. So get it while you can. Or build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, and cinnamon. Yum. If you're listening from Canada, Magic Spoon now ships there as well. Go to magicspoon.com slash Sarah to grab the new limited edition birthday cake or a custom bundle of cereal to try it today and be sure to use code and be sure to use promo code Sarah at checkout to save five bucks off your order. This offer is now good anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, but only when you use our code at checkout. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash Sarah and use the code Sarah to save five bucks off. And thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Hello, Tushy. Hello. There's a lot of good things about heading into warmer weather, but a butt crack dripping with hot summer sweat is not one of them. Just say goodbye, swamp ass, and hello, Tushy. The Hello Tushy 3.0 Modern Bidet is like a tiny shower for your undercarriage. It cleans soggy butts like a champ. But it doesn't stop there. It cleans itself with the Smart Spray Automatic Self-Cleaning Nozzle. I love a bidet. I love Hello Tushy. I don't like leaving the bathroom unless my asshole is immaculate two to three inches deep. And that's the truth. No one wants to work up a sweat in a hundred degree heat. That's why the Hello Tushy bidet attaches to your existing toilet with no electricity or extra plumbing needed. What? Already got a Hello Tushy on the pot? Treat your ass to the new 3.0 model. If you're new to the revolution, join millions of happy Hello Tushy customers right now and have a clean butt with every flush. Defeat swamp ass. Go to hellotushy.com slash Sarah to get 10% off plus free shipping. This is a special offer to our listeners only at hellotushy.com slash Sarah for 10% off. Hellotushy.com slash Sarah. Because when you think of a clean asshole, you think of Sarah. And we're back. Let's get right into it with some VMs. Slide into my VMs. You left me a message. Now I'm playing it for the world. Let's hear some voicemails. Sarah, actually, uh, we got some calls from the friends line. What do we got? Hey, Sarah. Um, big fan. Love the podcast. Uh, just a quick question. Why is there so much blood? <laughs> So much! <laughs> well, Weird Al, that is a great question. Um, you know, when you become a woman, a friend visits you every month, and it can really look like a literal fucking crime scene in your pants. But somehow you got it on your face, didn't you? That's so funny that he called it. What else? You're ugly. <laughs> That's my friend Tall John. <laughs> Fucking idiot. 
That's what he calls me. He calls me a delightful idiot. We um, tell each other that. I think I started it by telling him he was ugly (laughs) once. I just said it to him because it was just the meanest, stupidest thing I could say to someone. And um, he laughed so hard. And now just every once in a while, just just as we forget, as enough time has passed by, just get a message that says, you're ugly. (laughs) I don't know if it's very interesting to explain, but thank you, tall John. What else? Hi, Sarah. I'm sitting here watching Battle of the Sexes for the very first time, and mm-hmm. I had to pause it and call you to let you know how absolutely marvelous mm-hmm. I believe your performance is. I love that you can pause it and I call knew me. you were an amazing comedian and actress, but this just made me fall in love with you even more. So I want to know if you have any really fun memories working with Emma Stone or Steve Carell or honestly anyone else in this all-star cast. Thanks. I love you and I love the podcast so much. I loved doing that movie. I will say that usually because movies are not my bread and butter. I mean, if anything, I lose money doing movies because it keeps me off the road and stand up is my bread and butter. But I do love acting and I love being a part of movies. Usually I don't do movies that, (laughs) this sounds really dumb, but that have a lot of group scenes. That have a lot of group scenes because um, it's a lot to explain, but it means that there's a lot of coverage, you know, so it, it takes a really long time to do the scenes. And, uh, you know, the truth is making movies is, uh, um, epically boring, like uh, excruciatingly boring. You have to really love what you do. And I love acting, but so much of it isn't acting. It's sitting around and blah, 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 and all this stuff. But I took this one, and I'm so glad I did, even though all my scenes are with, like, ten other women. It moved really fast. They, uh, um, the directors, who are a married couple, Dayton and Ferris, uh, Jonathan and Val, Jonathan Dayton and Val Ferris, Valerie Ferris. Um, how many different ways can I explain their names and their um, how what they go by as directors? I don't know. Maybe there are more. They're amazing. They're fucking just cool. But they also have a plan. You know, they've got like a shot list planned out. They have a whole system and they keep the cameras moving. And it isn't all about coverage. It's all very fluid. And it, it, that movie kind of came and went oddly. But for people who are watching it on cable, it's so good. And the performances, I mean, Emma Stone and Steve Steve Carell are incredible. I barely, I didn't really work with Steve Carell. All my scenes were with Emma and the other tennis players, the other actors. And uh, we just fell in love. I had, that was probably the most fun I've had on a movie. Um, Became friends with a lot of them. Uh, Became very close with Natalie Morales, who is directing now and has a movie called Plan B. And I'm very happy to report that Emma Stone is the shit. She is just one of the coolest people I've ever known. And she was born to make movies. She, you know how like when you watch a Scorsese film, you're like, this is this movie was made by someone who loves movies. That's Emma. Emma loves making movies. She loves the process. She's not just sitting on her phone or like involved in other things, you know, in between shots. She knows every part of of every job of filmmaking. There the crew, the entire crew travels from movie to movie with her like a like a traveling carnival because she's awesome to work with. Um so I really can't say enough about her. She's like a real person. She she's not affected, but this is her industry, man. She's just made for this and it's really fun to see. All right, there you go. That's my little celebrity insight. What else? Hey Sarah, this is Sarah from Atlanta living in Austin now. 
just wondering what your take on age gap relationships was. Um, I seem to see a lot of, I guess, kink shaming. I don't, you know, I just see a lot of hate towards them. And I, I personally feel like there's a, a difference between grooming, predatory, statutory, creepy type shit and two people consenting adults of age that just have an age gap being together. I, I, I've always been into older men. I'm in my mid twenties. I, and I tend to like older men that are in their forties and fifties. And it just really seems to irk people and they seem to lump it in with, you know, like predatory behavior. And it's very hurtful because, I mean, we can't help what our kinks are and all of that. So I was just wondering what your opinion was on age gaps. Sorry for rambling. Thank you. Love you. That's actually an interesting question slash comment. Um, When I was in my 20s, I liked older guys too. And I dated older guys because older guys like a younger girls often, but I don't want to be judgmental about that. I try not to have an opinion on age, on age gaps. Um, there's certainly, you know, in Hollywood, there's an age gap phenomenon. That's pretty obvious. And maybe not Hollywood itself, but kind of affluent, people is that would that be fair to say it's not just Hollywood but you see it a lot in Hollywood there's that phenomenon that's pretty obvious and that can make one a little eye rolly sure men tend to be able to have entire second families with their younger second wife but is that wrong or it just or does it just make us mad you know what I mean is this is this is this something to judge? I don't know, actually. I don't find myself personally attracted to men who are attracted to younger women now that I'm older, you know, but slash and I have been that younger woman. I will say my ex-boyfriend from a, a, a few years ago, He moved on with a woman one half my age. Um, And they're still together and they're they're doing great. Um, And she's, you know, not even half his age. That sounds like a judgment. I'm just filling in, putting, you know, doing color commentary. (laughs) And but because I want to point this out. Even though our breakup was ridiculously amicable and loving, I mean, I truly wish him nothing but the best. I admit that when he told me he was with this much, much younger woman, I made a snide comment to him about it. You know, I said something like, you know, we, uh, you know I don't know. I made a snide comment. And afterwards, I was in the shower, and I had this realization, and I called him right away, and I apologized because I was like, look at me. I yell from the rooftops, love is love, when it comes to anyone else. (laughs) But when my ex loves a younger person, suddenly it's gross. I'm the one being gross, you know? That was ego talking. I deserve love. I'm certainly lovable. It has nothing to do with me, his love for her. I let my ego get involved. Um, But they seem really happy, you know? Yes, there are many men that fall in love with much younger women, and there are myriad reasons for that. Ego, mortality, uh, and also here's a reason, love. Connection. Even straight men are not a monolith. So, uh, 
Yeah, obviously, you know, when you talk about grooming and the, that's a completely different topic. That's children. That's those are teenagers. But when it just comes to a, a May December uh, relationship or what have you, um, you know, I gotta think I gotta say, love is love. Here's some ads. Noom. I've heard about all the crazy Hollywood diets and weight loss plans, but Noom isn't crazy at all. It actually makes perfect sense. Noom uses a cognitive behavioral approach. They focus on the why instead of the what to change your relationship with food. And that's always what it takes. That's always when people make the big change what it is. It's mental. No food is totally off limits. Keep eating foods you love while learning to maintain a healthier balance. Noom is legit. They have published over 25 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles about the science that goes into their approach to helping people achieve a healthier way of life. I've downloaded the app and can see how just 10 minutes a day using it can make a huge, huge difference. I also really like their empathic approach. They understand mistakes happen. They happen, and they don't make you feel bad about it. Start building better habits. That's what it's about. For healthier long-term results, sign up for your trial at noom.com slash Silverman. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash Silverman. Get your trial started today and finally change your relationship with food for the better. Headspace, baby. Wouldn't it be great if there were a a pocket-sized guide that helped you sleep, focus, act, be better? There is. And if you have 10 minutes, Headspace can change your life. Check out these stats. Just 30 days of Headspace lowers stress by 32%. And just four sessions can reduce burnout by 14%. And with Headspace, you can be 28% less sad in just 10 days. That's science. Headspace really, really can help you feel better. Overwhelmed? Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation for you. It's so good. Need some help falling asleep? Headspace has wind-down sessions their members swear by. And for parents, Headspace even has morning meditations you can do with your kids. It's so cool. And Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. I totally recommend using headspace to combat daily stress i love to just tune out for 10 minutes a day and get that needed quiet and that needed meditation you deserve to feel happier you do and headspace is meditation made simple go to headspace.com silverman that's headspace.com silverman for a free one month trial with access to headspace's full library of meditations for every situation this is the best deal offered right now head to headspace.com silverman today and we're back Hi, Sarah. This is Andy. Uh, I've called before. Uh, You played a message that I left about Jared Kushner, and I appreciate it. Yeah, fine bone. I've been thinking that one of the main Mm -hmm. problems we have in America is that a lot of people, and men in particular, don't understand that they are just inherently special and lovable just because they're human and just because they're born. So they try to dominate and accumulate and control and Mm. offend. And part of what I think contributes to people feeling this, this false idea that they're less special, that they're less than, is the institution of celebrity, you know, like which says some people are more than people. And right. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. I say this not uh, critically, uh, but I'm, I'm just curious since you are a celebrity. Um, and it may also explain why celebrities get attacked sometimes in the kind of reactionary right wing sphere. Um because there's sort of like envy and feelings of low self-esteem. Hope that makes sense. I really enjoy your show and um, take care. Yeah, that's interesting, especially the, the first thing you were saying about men or I don't know. It is, it all has to do with existence, you know, like, do I exist? I mean, I always used to say like um, when a heckler heckles, whatever they say, the subtext is always the same, which is, I exist! Right? Right? Um, so much to say. One, I would say celebrities, 
don't decide that they're celebrities. They don't make themselves celebrities. Other people make them that. Um, but then they have the these giant platforms that they can use of often in very typical left wing capacities, which the right does not like. Um, and that's why they say, you know, Hollywood, you know, uh, Hollywood elite, fuck them, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when Scott Baio speaks up, all of a sudden uh, Hollywood's not so bad, you know, <laughs> like the people on Fox News that are celebrity, you know, John Voight or Scott Baio or, uh, you know, the other ones. Those are those are OK. They're they're the good ones. They don't go like, well, I that's a little bit of a double standard. You don't know. What? They'd have to look inward for that. And there's they, they, they cannot. But uh, it is interesting that a lot of people on the right tend to be people. A lot of pundits on the right. Sorry, not I'm not talking about Republicans, but a lot of, you know, um, right wing pundits are people. And this sounds really specific, but I think you will find if you think through it, and this is the case, that there are people who did not get what they wanted out of show business. Bill O'Reilly, he was like a, a entertainment magazine host. You know, Dana Loesch from, from uh, the NRA uh, had a pilot that didn't go. Uh, Kellyanne Conway did stand-up. So many of these people, they have the same, they have the same fucked up thing as us performers where they need approval from strangers. But then when they don't get what they need from show business, they go where the love is and it's to the right. It's to, you know, uh, they become a right wing pundit or, or president <laughs> But yeah, you're right. People put celebrities on pedestals. And it's not something I can control, but it is something I can abuse. And that's a good point. That it is interesting that celebrities are held to a higher standard. Or at least held more accountable than our politicians why? I get, I, you know, a celebrity can get fired from a, a soda campaign, but politicians can go, yeah, no, I'm not going to resign. <laughs> what does it boil down to? Money. All right, what else? Hey, Sarva. This is Roshan from Bombay, India. I've loved you ever since that day I was that Conan episode of 93 that you were on. And I like you for the reason because, I don't know, you strike me as a very genuine person and and that's something I appreciate a lot. My questions regarding this, I don't know if it's only me, but uh, everything or most things around me for that matter today, like feels fake, you know, the social media, especially Instagram with its stories, the reels, the fucking TikTok, almost everything around this feels like is there to get some followers or some shit. Yeah. I'm not against sharing the things that matter to you the most or that makes you happy with your loved ones, but it's not that anymore. It's it's all one big thing, like to try and be likable, you know. And it and really bothers me. Conversations with people like who are trying to be extra del delightful or sweet when they don't mean to be really irks me. I'm only 23 and I'm I'm Holy already fucking sick of this. As, as far as I can see, it's it's only going to get worse. So how do you suggest we uh, navigate through this world with such inauthenticity? Listening to people like you or Bill Burr or George Carlin talk brings like brings me real joy because it's not sugarcoating. It is what it is. So yeah, that's that. Much love. Cheers. That's interesting. I, first of all, I cannot believe you're 23. <laughs> wow. Uh <sighs> It, I can't believe he's 23. I'm sorry. It's, he sounds like a get off my lawn person already. But I hear what you're saying. And here's the good news. Most people are not on social media. Most people are not on Twitter or TikTok. It seems like the whole world is. 
but they aren't and you don't have to be on it and you can uh, experience life otherwise with other people who are doing the same. But again, it really seems to come back to existence, you know? We struggle, all of us, with existence. And I think what you're saying about people wanting likes and people catering to views and likes and, and lo love in, in this technical form is about existence. You know, even like the, the phenomenon of selfies, it's like, I exist, I exist. It's like proof of existence, this fleeting proof of existence. And, uh, you know, I get it. I, I've partaken in that. It's, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's modern and it's like this new thing, but in a way it's probably has always existed in one way or another. You know, so I get it. It's hard. We live in a very technical, you know, tech world. And it's very, in, instead of heart and love and care and connection, it's likes and views and, and that can be really disconcerting. But you, you know, I think the most important thing here is to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. I hope that helps. <laughs> what else? Hello, Sarah. I hope this message gets to you. I am a little bit upset, and I just wanted to convey this to you. Okay. On your episode with the cop um, that you had a conversation with, you, in passing, used the karening joke maybe not a joke about when people are maybe racist or causing issues that don't aren't worth causing and my name is karen and i am i would say struggling to have the courage to bring up when that term so hurts me. Courage. Um, I am a survivor of abuse. I have currently a healthy relationship and I am a professional customer service manager, which is probably the opposite of every in brackets Karen that you think of. And the very act of me expressing my displeasure is considered karening and i don't know yeah. how to express that point maybe you can help me oh that's it <laughs> well that was so long and yet completely um incomplete karen um you have no obligation to defend your name. I understand it's unfortunate. We're in a moment. My heart goes out to you because you feel you can't complain and be named Karen. But also, you got this. This too shall pass. I get it. You feel you can't complain, and yet you did. You found a way. <laughs> Listen, Karen, some of my favorite people are named Karen. It's a little unfortunate overlap, but it will pass. If you just hold on, you're going to get through this. And I know it must suck. The funniest person I know is named Karen, Karen Kilgariff. And she really seems okay. <laughs> I know. Why don't you start a hashtag? Hashtag not all Karens. I think that will do a lot of good. I, it did wonders for not all men. Just kidding. But to be fair, there are a lot more straight men than women named Karen. So get in line. Behind straight men. <laughs> uh... Yes, go on. What else? <clears throat> Hi, Sarah. Um, this is a big fan. 
I used to love watching your program. I think it was a Sarah Silverman show, and you had a little dog on there that was the most adorable dog. And um, I was just wondering if, when you get your dogs, do you rescue them? Or I think it was a rescue, and you had a funny name. I can't remember. It was something silly, but um, just curious about your. I'm a dog lover. I rescue dogs when I can, and it just came into my head. So. Would love to hear about it. Thank you. That's a great question. You know, I don't think of it as me rescuing them. I think of it as them rescuing me. Wow! Wow! You're amazing! Uh, yeah, yeah, both dogs were uh, rescues, I guess. We would just say I, Duck, who on the show was named Doug, the only, um, the only character on the show who had a a different name than his own. <laughs> um, I got him when he was about five and a half at a rescue in Van Nuys. And he lived to be 19, but I'm going to be honest, probably should have had him put to sleep around 17, and I kept him alive selfishly. But he seemed so peaceful when he was sleeping. And then Mary, uh, I got at the uh, Burbank Pound which is different from a rescue. A pound is where, like, rescues come and get dogs from the pound, and then they're at rescues. The pound is a very sad place. It's, it, bless them, uh, pretty much run by um, off-duty cops. And uh, she just was in a cage, no name, skin and bones, uh, they, had, they told me they found her in a starving to death in a box uh, in the Costco parking lot in Burbank. And I just thought, oh, my God, just so close to bulk food. But now she's a happy little crazy dog. Oh, I love her so much. Um, I was sick recently, and she did not leave my side. It was pretty wild. Um... All right, there you go. I don't want to give too much time to this and how uh, incredible I am because I like dogs. What else? Hey, Sarah, this is Betsy. I was watching a rerun of Bob's Burgers last night, and it featured Andy and Ollie, who I absolutely love. Um, And it got me wondering what it's like to play siblings with your real-life siblings, since you and Laura both voiced the twins, and then you did it in the Sarah Silverman program as well. So um, what what's that like? Uh, do you all bring in things from your own childhood? Do you do things differently? Um, I think anything you could say on that would be really interesting because both of those shows are just great. Love y'all's work. Thanks. Bye. That's nice. I love working with my sister, and I, lo- um, <clears throat> I loved it on the Sarah Silverman program, and doing Andy and Ollie is really fun, and uh, – we're we're um <clears throat> we're very similar. We have the exact same this sounds weird, voice box. Um I mean when we're talking we, we sound like regular people. We sound like different people, but we have the same kind of I guess uh, if I were to be obnoxious instrument. So much so that, you know, I do Vanellope on Wreck-It Ralph and there are sometimes promotional things and stuff that she'll do. Penelope, uh, Vanellope, Jesus. And uh, I remember just, you know, it's just like she goes, uh, what do I do? And I go, just go all the way up. She knows just what I mean. She goes, just go, just go all the way up to here. <laughs> and she does it. But um, she's a brilliant uh, actor, brilliant writer, beautiful writer. And uh, she does a lot of voices for stuff too. So it was really fun to, um, you know, it was special on the Sarah Silverman program. Um, first of all, we were all really close. These, they were either my best friends already or, or people that I became best friends with for life. But to have someone there like Laura, someone who knew me forever, was really special. Like one time, um, we shot all the good nights. We shot like six good nights in a row for six different episodes because it's all, you know, a lot of times you shoot by location. So we were in my bedroom in the bed with Duck, aka Doug. And I say the recap, you know, the kind of good night of, of, you know, well, Doug, you know, today was a crazy day, blah, blah, blah. 
And I was having a really hard time in that moment in time. And uh, I was trying to, you know, be professional and um, get get the day done and everything. <clears throat> but I was um, holding back, choking back tears. And it got to the point where I couldn't get words out. I couldn't get my lines out because I was like, you know, when you're like this because you're just trying not to cry. And Rob Schraub, who is directing and who co-created the show, he said, uh, "You want to? Do you need five minutes?" And I was like, "Yeah." And um, gee, the whole crew just even thinking about them and how much they loved me and and I loved them, you know, like there's a, a camera op, Ron Vito, who I'm still very close with. And I just even the thought of him coming back on set after I had that episode and knowing that he would look at me with so much empathy would just make me cry all over again. But anyway, so Rob cleared the set and there I am lying in a bed that was supposed to be my bed in my bedroom with my real life dog. And he said, uh, Laura's here to shoot the next scene. Do you want me to bring her in? And I said, yeah, yeah. And Laura came in and we're in this dark set, shut down. Everyone's gone for a little while to give me some, some space, some time. And Laura just held me and tickled my arm and told me stories about when I was little. You know, and uh, that's just not something you, you get often, you know, like where there's someone who remember who knew you when you were little. She told me stories I couldn't even remember, you know, that they that that only she knew, you know, because because she was my big sister. Although on the show, she played my little sister, which she was very happy about. <laughs> I remember when I said, uh, you're going to play my younger sister. She was like, thank you. Anyway, it, yes, it is very special getting to work with your sister, and it, it certainly was for me. Dad, we're winding down. I don't want to startle you. I don't want this ending to take you by surprise. But the podcast this week is over. I hope you liked it, and I love you so much. And to everybody else, please subscribe. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You hear that at the end of every podcast, but really subscribe because it keeps us on the air. And if you like watching with your eye holes, check us out on YouTube. Bye. Hey. Hey, I wanna f- Hey. Bye. Hey, ya fucker.